Th thank you very much, and thanks for joining us to review a, a bit what we have learned from uh, looking a bit deeper in the, into this issue. Uh, this is basically a co-guest edited special issue uh, of world development with uh, Will Martin, and uh, the work started uh, a couple of years ago. So, as we all know, this, this topic of the role of agriculture in poverty reduction is a long-standing topic. Uh, I think going back a little bit, I think it's still useful to remember that, especially during the 2000s, thinking that agriculture could contribute to poverty reduction was already very daring. That was no longer bon ton. That was not the reigning opinion. Things have come around, I think, today. We start from saying, look, agriculture is clearly a big part of the poverty reduction agenda, but that hasn't always been the case. So in the sort of in the 2000s, there has been quite a bit of cross-country studies, a lot of work led by Martin Gravelli, and sort of looking at where the growth comes from, how does that affect poverty, sort of the composition of the growth itself, how it affects uh, poverty reduction, the speed of poverty reduction. Others have voiced other opinions and said, look, that's all good and well, but especially in sub-Saharan Africa, it's not that obvious, and given that agriculture hasn't been performed or hasn't performed for a while, especially in the 2000s, uh, that it's not so obvious that agriculture could indeed play, play that role. They also point to the fact that there's greater trade openness, so there's basically one could import food, one could uh, basically do other things, so it's not necessarily clear that Africa has a comparative advantage in that. And a lot of the work, and I think that still holds to some extent for, for the findings in this study as well, is it's not because one shows that productivity growth in one sector is more poverty reducing than in another sector, that tells you how to broker that growth and what the cost of it. At the end of the day, I think there's still a big agenda out there in terms of costing the interventions and comparing them. That's sort of the backdrop against which we basically, Will and I, decided that it's probably useful to organize a workshop, bring some of the thinkers on this topic together, and sort of also bring in a bit new data. So what I think the papers in this study do, is sort of pick up that debate and then deepen it. So on the one hand, the obvious thing is to bring more and more recent data to the game. So there's cross-country work in the papers. There's also some country case studies. I think there is sort of, at the time I was part of WDR on agriculture 2008, there was also quite a bit of debate on CG modeling versus econometric, it's observ observational versus modeled. So what is the right way? Some took a quite strong stance that a modeled approach is, uh, can't be valid because it's, it's cooked if you want. Uh, so clearly we, we took a different approach and said, look, each of these methods have their pros and cons. And I think we need to be a bit agnostic and let them speak to each other and, and take a look at the body of evidence and uh, sort of that's another aspect, I think, of the, of the, the papers in, in this special issue. And also on the econometric side, some of them deepened it a bit, uh, went, went a bit further. This is sort of general, broad-based, so looking a bit at conditioning factors and the channels, and then also kind of go a little bit more disaggregate. We talk agriculture versus non-agriculture, but what about non-agriculture? There are lots of subsectors in non-agriculture. Does agriculture have an advantage vis-a-vis -vis all other non-agricultural sectors? We talk about rural-urban, but what about the urban space? We can disaggregate that a bit. Or we talk about subsistence and, and home market, uh, and subsistence and, and, and producing for the market. So basically the papers kind of go one step, step deeper. Then I think another novel point in this is uh, how, at the macro level, how the interventions are financed, how that affects actually the poverty reducing outcomes. Is it through tariffs? Is it through aid? Is it through taxation? So all these different things may well have a way of influencing uh, the poverty reducing outcomes, and so some of the papers look into that. So all in all, there are eight articles. So these are the authors who contributed. Uh, several of them are in the audience here today. So, and we now kind of just review basically sort of some of the key insights. So, we would say that from this we kind of take eight messages, eight insights. And the key overarching message is still that these papers confirm that growth in agriculture in the aggregate, one percentage point GDP growth in agriculture would be more poverty reducing than a one percentage point GDP generated outside agriculture. I think this is still an important message to, to put forward uh, and, and sort of the, the, the different studies. And I'll go into a little bit of the evidence. 
But there are nuances. I think the papers also add important nuances, that the poverty-reducing advantage disappears as countries get richer. And so I think everybody's sort of familiar with the first one. It's more widely accepted today than it was 10 or 15 years ago. The second one actually also makes some sense, and, and that, that's sort of, I think we start to add new ones, and that's what the papers do. As I alluded to already, the extent of agriculture's edge is not the same vis-a-vis -vis all non-agriculture subsectors. I think it's another important insight. There's one paper which goes a bit into the effect of sources of, income, sources of growth on other welfare outcomes, in this case nutrition. And I think there the evidence is, is much more, in this case it's a case study, it's, it's more context specific. The fifth message I think is a very important one as well because a lot of the critique has been that the fact that agriculture may be more poverty reducing than non-agriculture may be more appropriate for landlocked countries, as some have argued. That's not what the papers in this study find. It can work to different channels. One channel here is, which is explored is throwing in underutilized household labor from Bangladesh. And then it also, the speed at which it works uh, is that it works faster if the elasticity of output to labor is lower and also if transport costs are lower. And then finally, I think a last important point which I've alluded to is uh, that how you finance it matters. That's something I don't think we have paid a lot of attention to. Let me now walk through four of these and then I hand it over to Will. We'll give a bit more evidence on the other four and then I guess we have a discussion. So the first finding, which we're more familiar with, growth in agriculture more poverty reducing than an equivalent amount of growth coming from elsewhere. It basically goes back to this, this basic equation where you look at the change in poverty and you look at where the growth comes from. So it's a regression basically on the growth of coming from agriculture or the growth coming from non-agriculture. These are share weighted, so basically it's one percentage point aggregate GDP growth coming from one sector versus the other sector. And then the epsilons is basically where you test whether they're the same or not. If these two, the two epsilons are the same, then this whole equation collapses to GDP growth. It doesn't matter where it comes from. So that sort of has been the, the workhorse, the workhorse equation, if you want. And then people have been, on the, on the econometric side, people have been adding bells and whistles uh, in, in order to do that. Now, here one looks at, and in, if you do it in a cross-country setting, then basically it is about the $1 a day at the time, $1.90 a day today, it can go to $3.10. So you can do different poverty levels, but typically it's done for the extreme poor. So one looks at the 10% poorest, across the world in a way. So we kind of we use the, the dollar or uh, the one dollar ninety a day. That's what a lot of work has done. Uh, the authors in this special issue, uh, Ethan Legan and Elizabeth Sadoulet, they took a slightly different stance and they said, look, let's look at the ten percent poorest in each country. So for each country they divided it up basically distribution, the quintiles or the deciles rather. 10%, 20%, etc., and then see whether growth in one sector versus growth in the other sector affects the income of the lowest decile more or less. So where do they grow more? They do a number of additional econometric uh, uh, fixes, if you want. I think the key thing is that they say, look, agriculture growth is very volatile. That might introduce some, may also be some uh, measurement error in it, which I'm sure there is. So let's instrument for that. Uh, to basically uh, take away some of that attenu attenuation bias. And the graph here is basically what they find. We're basically across these deciles, so you see that the green line, which is growth coming from agriculture, is always large. It's, it's significant up to the 70%. Uh, this is what they find across a whole series of countries, I think about 300, 320 observation spells. So this is the econometric evidence, which basically confirms a lot of what was found in, in some of the other studies. So this a second paper by uh, Ivanich and, and, and Bill Martin. They use uh, compu computer, computable general equilibrium models and then simulate it through what the effects are of a productivity shock in one sector versus the other on the household incomes. So they draw on the GTAP data, uh, sort of 
do this across a number of 31 countries, nine economies, etc. And then basically they basically look at 1% of GDP growth in one sector versus in agriculture, industry, or services, and what the effect is on uh, poverty, so from an equivalent amount of GDP growth. And again, across these different, these are country by country simulations, so you get larger poverty reduction, so it's negative, you get a larger poverty reduction than in the other sectors. Then some other authors also from IFPRI, I don't know uh, if they're here, Paul Dorish and James Turlow, they also look at five countries. They look into five countries, so they use much more disaggregated uh, modeling, uh, fewer countries, but more disaggregated, more factors, more household groups, etc. And in essence, in each of these five countries, they look at the effect on poverty and find the same, uh, basically, the green, you get more poverty reduction in each of these countries from growth in agriculture. So that's sort of the first insight. It sort of adds evidence with more recent data, more disaggregation, sort of confirming this broad overall uh, basic insight. I think an assumption we have been working on today, uh, and which sort of it's good to see that confirmed in the more recent data with more advanced uh, modeling. I take the same two graphs which I just presented because there is a second insight into these graphs. If you take the results by Ivanich and Martin, then we see that basically on the horizontal axis you have the GDP per person and you see basically that the difference between the advantage that agriculture has over or GDP growth in agriculture generated by productivity growth in agriculture, that the advantage it has over uh, growth generated in other sectors, that that declines as countries get richer. And that's sort of, uh, so that's one point, uh, one piece of evidence, if you want, pointing in that direction. Has been alluded to earlier on, but I don't think I have seen, or we have seen it in, in sort of doing it with CG modeling and, uh, and sort of put it out so nicely as it's done here. Now that's across countries. Actually, you see the same within countries. So here as well, so what Ligon and, and uh, Sadoulet find is that this advantage declines as households get richer. And sort of that's the second insight that the advantage of agriculture over non-agriculture declines as countries and people get richer. Uh, we get similar sort of indirect evidence to that, or for that, uh, if we look at by, by uh, James Turlow and Paul Dorosh, when we look at the effect of growth in different sectors and look at it, how it changes if we change the poverty line. So they go from 0.75 to $1.25. And basically the point to notice here is that, here's maybe more clearest. So here you clearly see agriculture being much, having a much better effect, much larger poverty to growth elasticity. If you take $1.25, that advantage declines. You sort of see that if you think. And, and you sort of see that across the five countries, that the effect, basically, the advantage uh, becomes smaller as the poverty line goes higher, which in essence means that you take, you go further into the distribution, which is sort of similar to what Ligon and uh, Sadoulet found. So that's the second insight. The third insight is what about so, so far, we have looked at agriculture versus non-agriculture. But not, um, not just like not agri all agriculture is the same, neither is all non-agriculture. It's actually 70% of your economy, just saying that's all the same. That's kind of a bit, uh, a bit broad brush. So often people have split it up in industry and services. But uh, James and, and Paul, they go one step further and split it up in a number of other. So, Again, this is a starting point that the effect of agriculture is larger than all the others. But then if you look at manufacturing and you look at trade and transport, so there, this is for all the, this is for all non-agriculture. This is the average of the po uh, poverty to growth elasticities across the five case countries they have done. So, but you see that the difference is smaller when you look at manufacturing and especially 
uh, even more so when you look at agro-processing. So there, the poverty-reducing effects are, are among the largest within the non-agriculture sector. Trade and transport comes out as the second. No surprise here that we don't find as much effects on mining. And then government services also uh, don't, they don't find so many effects there. So that's what, what sector is, is important. Uh, and actually, if you look at Africa today, we, we know that a lot of poverty reduction over the past 10 years has actually come through the service sector. So this, this trade and transport is part of that. Now, Chinson Diao and, and Maggie McMillan, they have, in another paper, they kind of don't look at it as sort of disaggregate, but they make an important point that the non-agriculture sector is sort of, on the one hand, the modern manufacturing sector, which is what we all talk about, labor-intensive export manufacturing. But then there is a large, more informal, what they call an in-between sector, which actually absorbs much of the labor. And they make the point that this is a very important sector where a lot of the poverty reduction passes through. But sort of in their paper, and then they see how uh, investments, and we come back to that later on, how investments could be infrastructure investments, how they affect the, the productivity of both sectors, and how we finance it, how that affects, uh, may have different results. So they emphasize the need to look at, unbundle this modern, <coughs> formal, trade-oriented, open sector, and then a closed in-between sector where actually a lot of the action may be happening. So coming to insight four, and uh, Derek Heddy has been contributing quite a bit to that. Uh, so starting from the, the sort of one piece of evidence which is out there that basically finds looking at cross countries that agriculture growth is most effective way to reduce malnutrition, possibly because it increases income of the poor. So some of the authors looked into that a bit deeper, and they went into Uganda using micro data, panel data, three-year panel data from Uganda. They actually had a bit of a hard time to find any effect. They had to push the data a little bit, I would argue. And they don't find strong effect, but what they do find is that long-term malnutrition, height for age z-scores, are negatively correlated if more of the income comes from crop production. And then when you push it a bit further, it seems like, especially when that crop, that share of income coming from crop production, when it's basically used for own consumption, and then when, if you then look at what they're growing, that it's a larger share of low protein cassava and plantain. So if they grow a larger share, they derive a larger share of their income from their own crops, and they don't market them but consume them, and then the composition of what they actually produce, if you look at that, then they find that basically in this case has a negative effect uh, on, on malnutrition. So it has to do with the type of their, their, their uh, production system, if you want, their farming system, if you want. But this is clearly a highly specific, context-specific uh, finding. So we wouldn't want to generalize that. And I think from that literature on the effect of growth from different sources uh, on nutrition, there is lots of context specificity in it. It's my understanding from the literature.